excited to be able to be a part of it. Um, okay, so today we have a panel of, of four visionaries that are gonna be sharing some of their stories and insights on exactly what that means. So um, this is Thinking Big, the visionaries. And we have Rob Burke with Pastime Arcade. We have Doc Mack with Galloping Ghost. We have Dave Lawton with Fun Spot Arcade. And we also have Mike Jacobson with Bad Penny Pinball. Um, so one thing I kind of wanted to define when I was preparing for this as moderator was what exactly does it mean to be a visionary in the field of pinball? And these were my thoughts. A visionary is someone who sees an opportunity when others don't. They don't just take chances on their dreams, they create them. Stepping out of their comfort zone becomes second nature as they see their vision come to life. This morning, we have an amazing lineup of visionaries who thought big and made their visions a reality. I'm gonna ask each of our panelists today to share in about five minutes uh, each what being a visionary means to them and a little bit about um, you know their biography and a little bit about them. So without further ado, why don't we start with Rob Burke of Pastimes Arcade. Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, I started uh, playing pinball back in the uh, early to mid 60s and en enjoyed it. And uh, the passion just kind of got out of control. And then, you know, I saw Roger Sharp's book and that kind of further fueled my interest in pinball. So I started collecting uh, one and two and then started putting ads in replay magazines and play and wanted to buy pinball machines. So I got several phone calls that were interesting. One was from a guy in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He had 200 games in his warehouse. So I flew down there and, uh, you know, I got pretty excited and uh, uh, decided to make a deal with him. And uh, what's interesting is those games made it back to my business. We have a family business. I stored the games there. And wouldn't you know it, one month later, we had a fire in, in that warehouse that burned about, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 games. But that was the big beginning of it. And then I got a phone call from Mark Fellman, and uh, he has a business in Omaha, Nebraska. And he says, yeah, I, got to, I saw your ad. I've got a lot of games. I got 400 games for, you know, that'll sell you. So I went to see him. But his price was a little bit too high for me. You know, Doc, we're used to buying pinballs for 100 bucks each or 150 whatever. He wanted $300 each. I said, man, that's your price is so high. At the time, you know, $300 was like retail. He said, yeah, but where else can you go and find four, 400 different titles? So I said, well, you got me on that one. So I bought some from him, but I didn't go as crazy as I could have. But the, the phone calls came in. I got a call from a guy from Wopaka, Wisconsin, and I bought um, uh, 10 games from him, $100 a game, which was the, the going price back then. But uh, the, the collection kept growing, and then I had the concept of, of having the uh, Pinball Expo. So... Um, you know, uh, uh, over the years, I built up so many games, I thought to myself, what am I going to do with all of them? And driving back by one of the local grocery stores that had been empty for several years, I said, well, maybe this could be a place to put the games. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll set them all up, and then maybe once a week, I'll open the door up, and I'll go there and play a couple games. And my wife said, now, isn't that silly to go through all that work just to, for yourself to play? So then I said, well, maybe you're right. So let me start putting these games together. And next thing you know, we had 50 together, 100 together. And let me say one more thing that I did that really helped the collection grow. Does anyone here where you guys live in your communities get these coupon money saver uh, books come in the mail? You know, whether it be for window panes or uh, pizza toppings, you know, there's every, anything and everything's in these coupons. So I said, hey, maybe so many people read these things. Let me put in the coupon. I wanted to buy pinball machines. Well, no one had done that. Well, I did, and I started getting phone calls like crazy. And typically, uh, you know, I got a lot of good deals, and that helped build up the collection to what I have today through buying these games onesie twosie. So, you know, we talked about the visionaries. I guess 
the vision I had as I kept growing and growing was to n never stop. So it's really, it's a passion, whether it be me or Doc or anyone here on, on the panel, that uh, it's a passion that got out of control. And, you know, we don't think about it that way because, you know, we enjoy it so much. I mean, I, I know Doc reached out to me. Uh, I had some contacts in China. He said, there's a video game in China I've been trying to get. I said, no problem, I'll help you. Well, it took a little, about a year, uh, close to a half a year anyways, but he finally got that game. But, you know, he is just as a wild man as I am. The, the, the collection he's got, you know, we both should be locked up because there's something wrong with us. <laughs> but it's been a fun lockup, and it's fun to share the, the hobby with you guys, you know. And, and um, not everyone was able to do it, but um, I've been able to do it and, and been able to share it with you guys over the years. But in my case, it's, it's the Spanish games and the Italian games and the games that never made it in the, into the U.S. market. It's my passion. So it's a visionary guy that got out of control. And next up we have Zeke. Video file that we'd like to start. This is Great. actually a PowerPoint. Fantastic. I'm sorry. Hold, hold on. We're just got a little technical issue here. I'm sorry. We got into the room late, so we didn't get a chance to set this up. But uh, I'll begin anyway. But there's a, a video file that I'm I'm kind of gonna introduce here that uh, briefly gives the fun spot history. Uh, I'm here today as the son of the founder uh, of Fun Spot. Um, I think. Do we have audio on this? Located on the second floor of Tarleson's Arcade on Lakeside it. Avenue, Bob Sprung. Okay, so here it is, and I'll pick up. In 1952, with just $750 he borrowed from his grandmother, Bob Lawton opened his own mini golf and arcade in the heart of Weir's Beach on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. The new venture was located on the second floor of Tarleson's Arcade on Lakeside Avenue. Bob's brother John helped him build the original mini golf course and the endeavor proved successful enough that the brothers formed a partnership at the beginning of the second season in 1953. In 1964, realizing they needed room to grow, the brothers moved the attraction to its current location and rebranded the business as Fun Spot. The mini-golf was moved outdoors, and a year later, in 1965, a pool room and small arcade were added. Also in 1965, Bob called upon his friend, Bob Montana of Archie Comics fame, to create a logo for Funspot. That year, Funspot's jester was introduced. If you look closely you'll notice he bears a striking resemblance to Archie's famous friend, Jughead. In 1966, the driving range opened. Then in 1971, Funspot opened its first themed park, Indian Village. It was an extensive project with design and construction overseen by Native American consultants. With Indian Village up and running, in 1976, Bob and the Funspot team turned their attention to their next project, a new themed park called Storybook Forest. Storybook was filled with the magical characters we all grew up with and was a delight to visiting children. When the 1980s arrived and games like Pac-Man, Asteroids and Space Invaders were taking over arcades, Funspot was ready to face the video game craze head-on. The Funspot token was introduced, adorned with the now-famous Funspot Jester. In 2024, Funspot still provides an authentic arcade experience by utilizing tokens and tickets. The arcade redeems over 75 million tickets every year and routinely has over 300,000 tokens on hand. As the 1980s video game boom accelerated, so did Funspot's expansion. During this time, a number of satellite fun spots opened, including several in New Hampshire and even one in Port Ritchie, Florida. In 1983, as the number of satellite arcades grew, Bob and the crew introduced fun spots most recognizable team member, Topsnuff. Guess how the lovable dragon got his name? You got it. It's fun spot spelled backwards. Also in 1983, fun spot introduced birthday parties. This is still a huge draw for the arcade and brings in thousands of guests each year. 
The late 1980s were a period of rapid expansion for Funspot, beginning with our mezzanine in 1986, then our kitty room in 1987, and finally, our 20-lane bowling center in 1988. When the 1990s hit and the video game boom ended, arcades across the country were closing their doors for good. During these years, Funspot worked hard to reinvent itself and offer more diverse attractions. In 1996, we built our 400-seat bingo center and added the DA Long Tavern to Funspot's bowling lanes. The tavern is named after Bob's grandfather, Denny Long, and the decor celebrates the old weirs in which Bob grew up. In 1998, Funspot continued to look toward the future by reviving the past. At the suggestion of Funspot's longest-term team member, Gary Vincent, the American Classic Arcade Museum was established. The project was spearheaded by Gary and quickly became one of the largest collections of pre-1987 arcade games available for the public to play. The museum still holds true to Gary's original vision and is a living attraction, constantly changing and evolving. Once the Classic Arcade Museum was open, Gary launched the International Classic Video Game Tournament, an annual competition that attracted players from around the world. It wasn't long before record scores were being set, including the first ever perfect Pac-Man game, achieved by Billy Mitchell in 1999. In the year 2000, Bob shifted focus from classic games and pursued one of his passions when he opened the Fun Spot Indoor Golf Center. The new attraction offered golf enthusiasts a way to enjoy their favorite pastime during cold winter months. As Fun Spot continued to grow throughout the 2000s, it was suddenly thrust into the limelight with the 2007 release of the surprise hit movie, The King of Kong, A Fist Full of Quarters. The film follows gamer Steve Wiebe in his attempts to take the high score record for the 1981 arcade game Donkey Kong from Billy Mitchell. The movie is largely set in the American Classic Arcade Museum at Funspot, and overnight it seemed, Funspot became a household name. The King of Kong drew enough attention to the arcade that in 2008, Guinness World Records took note and officially named Funspot the largest arcade in the world, a record it continues to hold today. But Funspot's not done. We're constantly looking toward the future and expanding our offerings. In 2023, we launched our new and exciting Pinball Outpost. The Outpost was designed to have a retro Star Wars sci-fi feel and be home to Funspot's growing collection of pinball games. It features nearly 60 tables, from classic titles like Meteor to popular new Stern titles like The Mandalorian. Stern Insider members can take advantage of our Insider-connected games and strive to complete seasonal quests and set record scores. Funspot's Pinball Outpost is also host to monthly tournaments, offering plenty of action for pinball enthusiasts. With such a rich history of providing family fun, as we look to the future, you may be asking what's next for the largest arcade in the world. Honestly, we don't know. We'll always do our best to keep growing, evolving, and providing quality family entertainment. And we'll never forget that it all started with just $750, and one man's dream. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so just uh, to reintroduce myself, I'm David Lawton, and that's my father up there, the visionary really behind Funspot, Bob Lawton. Uh, he is uh, a living legend. He's somebody that uh, I aspire to do half of the things that he did during his uh, lifetime career building up Fun Spot. Uh, he started in 1952 when he was just 21 years old, and I don't think he had in mind uh, what you have today in Fun Spot, but uh, he built that little mini golf down in the Weirs uh, with his brother, and they started that first year with one goal in mind, and that was to provide a safe place for families to go with their kids or leave their kids to go have fun in a safe atmosphere that was also affordable. Uh, we strive to keep that in mind today at Fun Spot as we add new attractions. We try and keep with that formula. Um, and um, through the through the years, uh, I've spent uh, at Fun Spot working with my dad side by side. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, he he really was an inspiration, uh, still is today. 
uh, unfortunately passed away in 2021, and uh, that changed Funspot dramatically. Uh, he was there uh, uh, virtually every day he spent uh, working at Funspot. Anytime you wanted to meet and, and chat with uh, my dad about uh, what was the order of the day, he could be found in the restaurant sitting on some red, <laughs> red benches that he had painted himself. Uh, he was a very frugal man and a uh, hard-working individual. He didn't sit behind a desk with his feet up smoking a cigar or something like you might think of a successful businessman's uh, icon, but uh, he really worked hard to uh, build Funspot up, um, and um, he, he really is an inspiration to me uh, today as I take over as part of the second generation of Lawton family owners. There's now uh, my sister Sandra, as a general manager, my cousin Steve, who is the CFO, and my cousin uh, Randy, his brother, who is the chief of technical services for Funspot. So we're all second generation um, Lawton family. We've got our hands full, we know, uh, moving into um, um, perhaps troubled waters, you know, where the entertainment industry has gone through hell and back uh, with the COVID years. Um, we lost my dad at the end of, uh, uh, 2021 when the recovery was starting. We didn't know where we were going to be today. 2023 was our, our best year yet at Funspot. Uh, miraculously, we had uh, a tremendous year. And um, as, a, as the new um, crew began to find our legs under us and uh, figure out our path forward, uh, we started to look around for different roles and, and needs and I'm fitting now into the business as the basically an operations manager and with a big focus on the arcade. So I came into the arcade area with a, with a fresh set of eyes to see how we're doing um, and quickly realized that we had a lot of work to do uh, on the floor. And particularly for me and for my wife, Eva, who's here today, uh, we began to enjoy playing pinballs and realized that the collection of pinballs that Funspot had built through the 70s and 80s uh, was aging and a lot of the focus of the current uh, tech department had been on um, what was really the money makers for the business and that's the redemption and more of the family oriented business. So the pinballs had fallen by the wayside and we were quite disappointed in the condition of those. Um, so we began to uh, take it upon ourselves to um, rehabilitate what we had for pinballs. And as I started to look around um, as the new operations manager um, at what was going on around us, I found Pinball Map, which was a, a great resource for me because I, I quickly realized by going through the comments that we had a real problem. And I actually used that as a, uh, a point of leverage to fix the problem by printing out a list of all the comments of the games that had problems, particularly pinballs, uh, on our property, and I handed that to the tech department. And uh, we've had a long, uh, long road, but uh, the, the pinballs today, we're, we're turning around those negative uh, opinions of Funspot's pinball collection. And um, the, uh, the overriding theme, I think, we, we are trying to um, revamp where we're at in that uh, market and develop um, the pinball outpost. So the Pinball Outpost is a uh, section of our main floor that um, we now have uh, monthly tournaments in. We're part of the Stern Army, and we also host New England Pinball League uh, weekly tournaments during their seasons. Um, so we've, we've, I think, turned around a lot of uh, the problems that we had, and going forward, we're uh, obviously looking to expand that collection. And uh, we've had some, some great successes um, and it's, it's not without a little bit of tr trepidation that we do some of the things that we did with the games. For instance, one of, I guess, the really the touchstone moment um, for what we were going to do with our collection was when Xenon uh, was one of those comments about Xenon, which we'd owned since it was born, basically. Um, that game had virtually no paint left on the, on the play field. It was, it was stripped of just by sheer force of weight of all the play that it had endured through the 80s. Um, so it was either junk it or sell it for scrap. 
uh, or put a new play field in it? And that was the question, that one of the first questions that that new team that we have now as the second generation owners was put to, what are we gonna do? Um, and, and, and I pushed for it and we eventually did it. We put in a new play field in that game. Uh, Penny-wise, I don't know. It was a it was a huge huge mistake maybe uh, by some would say you know if you were looking at it from a purely business standpoint, but I love that the fact that it's still the same xenon cabinet that we put on the property in the 80s, um, and we have in house today. We have some real gems in the collection uh, that are available to play, but xenon particularly was one of the ones that was kind of a touchstone moment where. We all decided that this is what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we honor the legacy of what we have here because we're not just a collection. We're a collection of games that were purchased new and have lived through the 80s, and, uh, and we want to make sure that we keep that collection up. So I'm a proud member of the new management team of the Lawton family uh, going forward, and we're, we're certainly reaching out and embracing pinball going forward, and I'm really happy to be invited here today. Wonderful. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for sharing that history. Mike Jacobson is up next with Bad Penny Pinball. Uh, my name is Mike Jacobson. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm co-owner of Bad Penny Pinball. Uh, we've been open since July of 2023. Um, we started out with 26 pinball machines and uh, now we're up to 58, and I have room for four more in the building. Um, the building, uh, the building is under foreclosure, and it's a big empty building. Um, it used to be like a, a market type building with multiple different vendors in it, but ever since the previous owners let it slide, they, they didn't make it through the pandemic. Um, but the bank owns it now, and they've been, we've been working with them to try to get more games in there. I keep sneaking games in, and there's not really anybody there to tell me no, so that part's been pretty cool. Um, I started playing pinball about six years ago. Um, just went to, I started out with tournaments. I went to all the tournaments, local tournaments, and then I started going to uh, pinball expos and stuff like that. Um, I got my first pinball machine right before the pandemic. It was a Doctor Who, and I played that for a bit, and then I took it all apart. And then it was all, I, I had a one bedroom apartment, and everything was spread around my living room. Uh, my girlfriend at the time didn't really like it. Um, we'd ha try to have dinner, and I'd have to clear off the table of all the parts and stuff and redo it. Uh, but that's how I learned how to how to fix these things. I, I had electrical knowledge before that, but once I lifted up the play field, I was like, yeah, I know what all this stuff is. Um, and then from there, it just kind of spiraled out of control. I, I bought them one or two at a time from Facebook, and, and now I have over 100 machines in storage and on the floor. And I, I love doing this stuff. I love having people play these games. I go for a lot of the rare titles and stuff that you can't find any anyplace else. Um, I just want to bring pinball joy to everybody who wants to come out and play it. Wonderful, thank you, Mike. Awesome to, sp to spread that pinball joy. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Doc Matt with Galloping Ghost. Thank you. So, my story really started uh, as a child. I, I started playing arcade games at about five years old and was just enamored with them. Um, video games really brought me and my dad and brother closer together. And for me, it was just something, it was a consistent. Uh, I always knew I wanted to work in the video game scene. And around 19... 94, uh, we opened up Galloping Ghost Productions after a chance encounter with uh, Ed Boon from Mortal Kombat fame and the voice of Rudy from Funhouse. And he was telling me how difficult it is to get into the video game scene and in, in the gaming, game design and game development. And that really pushed me down the road. It's like, okay, if I can't get into this company, I'm gonna have to open up something on my own. So we started work on a game called Dark Presence. And that, growing up for me, I was very socially awkward, very antisocial. Um, I actually dropped out of high school because I, I didn't like being around people. I, I had no connection to them and just was very socially awkward. Uh, so with the production company opening up, 
I quickly found out that it was going to be very difficult to make a video game by myself. Um, I started learning everything I could. I got into graphic design. I got into music, learned to play basically every instrument out there, um, learned the electronic side of it, artwork. Uh, we decided to film our characters because I couldn't draw well enough, so we were going to digitize it like Mortal Kombat. Um, studying martial arts my whole life, I was going to do all the fight choreography, and it still had like the programming element, and how do we put this all together? So started to assemble a team, and that kind of got me talking to people and like-minded people. And along the way, those people, some of those people are, are still with us to this day. Uh, as the game design grew and grew, it, it was taking the longest time to get the game finished. Uh, we would start going to arcades, and we saw how so many of them were closing. This is probably 2004, 2005. And we started to formulate a business model for what would become the Galvin Ghost Arcade. And it was really based on seeing these arcades closed, and it's like, why are they closing? It's lack of maintenance. People aren't caring for these machines anymore. And we went back into our filming studio. We, after working on the game for 10 years, uh, we decided we would need to refilm the game. So we went back into our filming studio, filmed for about four years, seven days a week, um, came out of the studio and got into the post-production. And while in post-production, uh, we still kept seeing it. Every time we would see an arcade, we would go into one and nothing would work and they'd be talking about closing their doors. So in 2010, just on a whim, we were like, you know, if we're going to be releasing arcade games, we need to kind of try to bring that back. And that was really the goal. Everything just lined up. It was went unbelievably smooth. Um, we had, went on Craigslist, we found 114 machines for sale for $5,000, which we didn't know what we were getting. It was just okay, here's, here's, we're going to do this. It was, I called the guy, Steve Campbell, who we rented our filming studio from, and he was like, yeah, I've got a building you can go into. Like, okay, we'll, we'll try this. So we, we started talking to people in the industry, and everybody's like, you're out of your mind. Nobody wants to play arcade games. Nobody wants to play pinball. And it's redemption. How much redemption are you going to have? I'm like, you're not going to have any redemption. I don't want to play redemption. I'm a v I'm, I play video games and pinball machines. And in industry people, including well-known people like Larry DeMar, were like, you seem very passionate about this, but you're insane. This is a, out of the box, this is a failed business. And this is Larry DeMar who's made so many iconic video games. It, it was the, the knife in the, in the chest. It was like, you're telling me this isn't going to work. That that was so hard to hear. But I didn't think it was true. And in hearing that, just like with hearing from Ed about how the difficulties, it was, that's going to fuel me to make this succeed. I'm, I'm going to do it. I want to find out for myself. And the arcade opened August 13th, 2010. And we had a block. Uh, the line was a close to two blocks long. Um, it was something, the guy coming through, one of the first people through the doors, had a, he made a custom Galloping Ghost t-shirt that said, happiness is the Galloping Ghost Arcade. And we opened with 130 machines. And seeing that line, that enthusiasm for these games, it, it was just such a, an unbelievable thing. I had people coming up to me. We, were, we did a 48-hour launch event. People saying, oh, I can't believe that this is going to be here. We hope, it, we hope it works, and what an amazing thing. Every day, we would open up, and we would see people with their parents, with their kids, showing them games that they played uh, back in the, s the 80s and 90s, and it was such an unbelievable thing. And it just seeing that, it, it led all of us on, on the staff to want it to keep growing. So we kept adding and growing and more and more games. And um, there was so many games that I wanted to play. 
stuff that would pop up online on Craigslist or on on uh, just through collectors, and it was like, oh, I want to play that. And it, there was such a a selfish side to it of like uh, the whole arcade was basically like, well, much like Rob, it's like I'm gonna make something so I can go play my games. It's gonna be cool. If anybody shows up, that's cool too. But that wasn't the the idea on it. It was. It was just kind of like, I'm going to do these things. Um, we decided to do events where we had industry people coming out. Uh, back then, talking to the industry people, the industry people were like, nobody wants to see us. Actors from the Mortal Kombat games and uh, people who worked on Qbert and Brian Colin who worked on Rampage. So they're like, our games are sold. Nobody wants to play these games. And it's like, no, no, no. You have this huge fan base, and generally, I just want to hear your stories. But we'll do these big events. And it was so amazing to see so many people come out and have that like-minded interest in it. And it kept growing and growing and growing. Uh, we were profitable after about eight months uh, with the arcade. And we kept adding things left and right, new machines. Uh, quickly, quickly, we're up to 200 machines and then 300 machines, and then 400 machines. Um, we had to keep expanding, going, fortunately the building that we got was five buildings long, although there was other businesses in those spots. So a business would go under and we'd take over that spot and expand the arcade. Uh, it, it really, it, it just kept, uh, the demand for it kept making it grow. Um, we started going on, in 2015, we started doing the Monday Mystery Game where we would add a new arcade game every Monday. Without fail, in nine years, we haven't missed a Monday. So anytime a player comes back to the arcade, there's going to be something new there. Uh, w the things that we learned along the way was maintenance was going to be key. And it is so important. We still run everything with original CRT monitors. Um, we kept growing on every aspect of it, starting with the production company, then going to the arcade. We were spending so much money on artwork, we decided to buy the printing company next door to us, and we opened up Galloping Ghost Reproductions. And then we started scanning in all the us artwork that we had, and then making that available to other collectors to restore their arcade games. And it, it just kept growing, and there was really not really anything planned. There was no, like, let's put a thousand games on an arcade floor. When we opened Fun Spot, it was all anybody talked about. It was like, they've got more games than anybody. And it's, are you going for that? And it's like, no, we're just, we're going to be here tomorrow. We're, we're, we're doing the next thing. It's just open the arcade and see who's here, see who comes out to play, and make sure everything's running right. So it, it was just this constant, there was no set goal. And it qu quickly kept adding step by step. Um, we started to do get invited out to shows. And there was a show in New Jersey we were doing. And we're like, OK, we're going to show off our Dark Presence game there. Um, the show started from people approaching us on how to open arcades. Because we had come up with the free play formula. And it, it seemed to be working. So. Currently, we've helped just under 40 arcades uh, open worldwide, sharing our business model, sharing all the information, our numbers, um, showing how to build a community, how to work with social media, uh, how to buy and sell games. I know Rob has called me so many times, like, would you pay this much for this? And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a great deal. Rob is finding some amazing deals out there. You're, you're an instigator. But that's the thing. It's it's never really a set direction. When we did this show, uh, this was a gentleman that we were helping him open his arcade. Told him to open a run a convention first, so he could see what the industry in his area was like. He grew the show, sold his show, and then used that to buy an arcade and open a, an actual venue. And it it worked very much according to the plan that we gave him. Um, when we were out there, we brought all the Mortal Kombat actors with us. We brought Brian Cullen, who made Rampage, and Jeff Lee, who made Qbert. Brought them out to the show, and we're sitting around in the middle of the It's 2 a.m. in the morning, and we're like, just talking. 
with the legends of Mortal Kombat and these guys that have made these unbelievably historic games. And it was, it was like, man, it would be great if we could do more. And the Mortal Kombat guys are like, you're into martial arts, we should open up a martial arts school together. I was like, yeah, I mean, if that ever happens, sure. And three months later, the landlord calls me. He's like, hey, we have a building over two blocks down from the arcade. Do you want it? Like, yeah, I do. Oh, what are you doing in there? Gym and martial arts school with the Mortal Kombat actors. Okay, sure. And so it's just been one thing after the next. When we didn't think we were doing pinball well, pinball players, you got pinball players push us so hard because your demand levels are way up there. Everything has to be perfect. Every light, every flipper, everything has to be great. And I'm a video guy. I love pinball, but I'm a video guy. Pinball, you're shooting a pinball around at plastic. It's going to have problems. And But we, we try. We try. And it, it drives us to constantly do better. We had pulled pinball almost off the floor to the point where it was gone. And a handful of things happened. Landlord calls me again, and he's like, hey, you know, we had too many people playing at the arcade, just casually playing pinball. And video players, they don't know that you have to be a little bit more gentle on, on pinball. So the machines were taking such abuse, only having 11 machines. But it was still there. We wanted to have pinball. Landlord called me again. He's like, you know, you rent in a couple of buildings from us. I got another one. What, would you do anything else in there? It's like, uh, yeah, I guess we could open up a full pinball place. If we had it separate, we could have a lot more machines, and we could really grow that. And that became like a whole other element to it. Uh, it, it was, it, it's separate, but close enough you can walk to it. So it was just another piece to the puzzle. Um, pinballs, there's so many... As everything kept growing and growing, uh, we added a, a Galloping Ghost Garage, which would then help the pinball business because, like, there's ramps. We have to weld stuff. We have to sandblast stuff. We need to we need to fix things. So we, we picked up a, a garage, and everybody on staff has sports cars and motorcycles, so it was a good side benefit for those people. But it, it, the, the, the vision of it, it's always just been to keep pe making people happy and keep growing it and keep adding more and keep trying to outdo what we've done. And it, it's an amazing thing. It, it's We couldn't do it without the dedicated people that we have on, on staff. For There's now seven, there's eight businesses within Galloping Ghost. Um, it's 16 people running everything. The tech side for the arcade is two people, three people technically. But for 1,009 machines at the arcade and 46 pinball machines at Galloping Ghost Pinball, it's an, an everyday thing. It's we get there at 6 in the morning and we start fixing stuff because we, we it's all for, for the players. If it's not playing right, they're not going to have the enjoyment that we all had back in the 80s and 90s when these games were coming out. So it, it's really about, it's just kind of a, a revolving machine of fix everything, make people happy, and then in return we get to be happy because we get to keep growing. So and it, it's something, getting to do a panel like this with uh, people that have done it for so long, and Rob, congratulations, 40 years on Pinball Expo. That's that's where the bar's at. It's it's it keeps going. And tomorrow we'll do the same thing. We open we get at the arcade at six in the morning. We go through everything, make sure everything's up and running. And it, it was so fortunate for myself, everybody on the staff that I get to work with. They're so amazing. Tom and Jeremiah, Brandon, those guys are just incredible. Doug Fox, our tech, Ken Mo Ken Walker, and Adam Stone. Just so amazing to, get to work with the people that I get to work with, to s talk to the players I get to talk to, to talk to the collectors that I get to talk to, and the industry people. It, it's just such an amazing thing. And the amount of support is just incredible. And it 
really motivates myself and everybody that I get to work with to keep growing. And we have the plans that we have, we're adding a second and third floor to the arcade. We're trying to acquire more buildings to expand the parking lot. And it, it's all just about what, what are we going to do tomorrow? And it's going to be big. Thank you so much, Doc Mack. Yep, go ahead, Rob. Uh, I'm going to say one quick thing about Doc Mack. You know, um, uh, seeing these video games and, and, and uh, having some people kind of rub off of me, they said, hey, you should start collecting video games. So I um, started collecting them. And then I didn't know about Doc Mack. I heard about Galloping Ghost. But I, I decided to do something and there's an expression, one and done. Well, this is one of those one and done shows. But I decided to do a show in Rosemont uh, just for video games. But the reason I'm mentioning this is, who did I reach out to? The king of videos, Doc Mac. I didn't know Doc Mac from the, from the neighbor down the road. This guy was a complete stranger. I called him out of the blue. Hey, Doc, I heard about you. I heard you have a lot of video games. I want to do this video show at the holiday end. Can I borrow some games to try to, you know, make it a nice event. Well, not only did I borrow them, I think he gave me like, uh, let me use like 50 games, or if not more. But I guess the point being, this gentleman has got the heart of gold. He didn't know me from Adam, and he helped a complete stranger. So I think this is why he's growing the way he's growing, is because people see, like myself and the other people here in the panel, the passion. The passion drives anyone who's successful. And we don't do it for the money or the fame. It's just because we, we enjoy it so much. So, Doc, my, my hat off to you. And my dream, my dream is to one day own a pair of Doc Mac black gloves. <laughs> then I know I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing that... I'm really hearing on this panel today, um, and the stories are just so beautiful, um, is each of you have gone about your vision differently, but your passion has kept the momentum for it. And then also um, seeing how other people respond to that is another driving factor in which keeps you going. Uh, my family has benefited from each of you doing what you do and has really driven our, um, our joy and happiness in the gaming field. And so thank each of you for that and for doing what you're doing. It's, it's amazing and beautiful and you bring people together. So thank you for doing that. Um, we are down to the last 10 minutes of this panel. And so what I would really love to do is open up the floor for questions. I'm sure there are many, many questions that um, maybe you came here before with or that popped up during the panel discussion. So please, please feel free to um, go ahead and ask questions of this amazing panel today. This is, this is on. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is more for the folks on the end, uh, Doc and Rob, who I kind of, their collection grows faster than their available space, or how how do you manage that kind of feeling as, you know, someone who also has space issues with their collection? How much are you willing to uh, put more effort onto the space side of things to try to move it around versus you know the main pursuit of getting more stuff. Doc, I'll start one one answer. I'll start with ready, Doc. You'll like this one. It all depends on the bank. Doc, take over. If the bank lends you the money, you'll go forever. So we've had um, with Monday. We know every week we have to put a new game out, and where it's going is usually something we worry about on Tuesday. Um, we've been very fortunate to be able to get all the the buildings on the main thing on the main arcade level, uh, but now it's really just about going up. Uh, and as Rob said, it's 
the expansion that expansion is outrageously expensive um we're doing it but it's just a matter of how we're going to fund it uh we've got enough time to where we can figure that out and uh we've got hundreds of games in the vaults still so uh every, every monday a new one's still going up um where they're gonna by the time it's done we want to have room to have at least 2500 machines easy plus pinball down at the main arcade side plus a video game and console center plus a museum there's so many things that with three floors spanning the entire block that we cover we're going to be able to do pretty much everything so it's it's just a matter of time and patience and uh, making everything line up uh, they say that once you buy your first pinball machine that they just keep multiplying and you keep getting more uh, the same thing goes for storage units the first time you get a storage unit you know those keep multiplying too pretty soon you got like three or four going i just i just chime in that uh we have uh, the American Classic Arcade Museum is pretty much doing what you folks are doing and, and uh, have been collecting kind of quietly behind the scenes. And that's uh, the third floor of, of Fun Spot is the space where the American Classic Arcade Museum has uh, been caretaking for these uh, video games, a lot of which Fun Spot, you know, in the late 80s were, you know, uh, kind of moving off the floor and into storage. Uh, and eventually would sell off or get rid of one way or another. But ACAM came about by, uh, as we saw in the video, uh, Gary Vincent's uh, uh, vision there for you know some place that we could keep these uh, rarities. So he's been, um, we're finding out, carefully squirreling these away in storage units around the area. And uh, most recently uh, decided to purchase some um, um, yellow uh, freight trailers, and now we have a whole host of uh, full yellow freight trailers on the property, and uh, we're looking, uh, working with Gary to try and squeeze more uh, and more equipment onto the floor every day. We're a total of uh, 70,000 square feet of space uh, spread over three levels, and uh, we're, we're uh, always uh, posing the question, you know, do we really have room to buy one more game? And I'm the first one on the team to say, absolutely, don't you worry about it. We'll find a spot for that. Uh, the layout of, uh, i got to say, my dad's uh, vision for the layout of Fun Spot was always uh, uh, to try and keep the space um, open and uh, very light and airy feel for the most part in the areas where families would be playing. Um, that's different than what is ACAM's area. It's ACAM's area on level three uh, is set up with the uh, red uh, uh, <laughs> translucent panels in the ceiling, and it's kind of dark, and it's kind of crowded, like you would experience in one of those original 80s arcades. So we have something for everybody at Fun Spot. So it's, a, it's been a, a lot of fun to be a part of, and I think uh, uh, fun to see the future and look to where we can grow and, and find new places for some of this uh, rare equipment. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say great presentation. Doc, I got to visit the Galloping Ghost Pavilion. It was unbelievable. So many games where I was like, oh my god, I can't, you know, I hadn't played that in so many years. But you had so many, and I'm just wondering, kind of what is y'all's White Whale, the game that y'all have been looking for forever, but you just can't seem to find? Um. There's, there's not too many. It's getting much harder to find games that we're really looking for. Um, Predators would be, I would say, the the one that is kind of the unicorn right now. Uh, unreleased Williams game uh, was four cabinets, and uh, I've got two empty cabinets, but no board yet. So it, it's, aside from that, and a few Laserdisc games from Japan, Time Gal, uh, Revenge of the Ninja, um, yeah, those are pretty much the top three. One day, we'll find. We'll find. Uh, Dave, a uh, brief question for you. Uh, a lot of us who aren't necessarily in the Northeast heard about Fun Spot and discovered Fun Spot through the King of Kong. Um, can you briefly talk about how that relationship came about and how filming went on and th how they approached you and how that kind of blew up? Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, that was um, that was largely as a result of the exposure that we got 
from the early uh, international video game tournament days. Um, and, at, and at that point, it was uh, my, I wasn't that involved in the business at the time, honestly. So I don't think that we actually uh, sought out um, anyone to you know, come and film something here. And when they approached us to you know, come in and, and do some filming, uh, we, uh, we just, we didn't know who they were, you know, we, it was really just a matter of, uh, you know, it seemed like it would be okay. We had no idea what was going to be produced or the fact that the, the director, uh, w it was his first project, I think at Lionsgate, uh, who went on to do, I uh, know, Horrible Bosses and, uh, and other great movies, but his first, uh, breakthrough movie was the King of Kong movie and, uh, that led us to be thrust into the limelight uh, beyond where, uh, I mean, typically Fun Spot is pretty well known up and down the East Coast. So uh, when I jumped out here and started talking about Fun Spot, I've gotten a few, hmm, well, oh, how interesting. But uh, I think uh, King of Kong really put us on the map, and I think uh, that, that was a tremendous thing for Fun Spot and, uh, and uh, helped us to grow the name quite a bit. Yeah, Dave, I was there, and I can say that uh, it was already established that people were coming in with cameras from earlier years of the tournament just to film the world record attempts or getting past the kill screen. So it was sort of a push beyond that, but it was already known that people were coming to shoot video at those tournaments. Hmm. Yeah, and I think um, you know one of one of the connections we had with I think it was Seth Seth Gordon was the director, I always get the name wrong, but uh, he had come to find out that uh, he was a frequent visitor to the Lakes Region area of New Hampshire and he would come up with his family and stay, uh, I think it was probably about a mile and a half from Fun Spot and uh, he didn't enjoy going to the beach so much so he would walk all that way up to Fun Spot to be able to play uh, pinball and video games while his family went to the beach. <laughs> Wonderful, well, I hate to say we are at our hour, so to stay on schedule, we better wrap it up. Thank you to each of our panelists today. Big round of applause.